like most kids that grew up in the 80s, I was fortunate enough to grow up watching some really great cartoon shows. Of course, I watched the usual round of suspects like He-Man, G.I. Joe, Thundercats, and Transformers. But I was also able to watch lesser known or more obscure shows like Adventures of the Galaxy Rangers, Tiger Sharks, Visionaries, Jason the Wheeled Warriors, and Dino Saucers. Dino Saucer. But out of all the shows that flew completely under the radar, the one that left a big impression on me was a show called Spiral Zone. Japan, 1985, Bandai would release a line of futuristic military-themed figures and vehicles called Spiral Zone. Designed by Kunio Ukawara and Kazuhisa Kondo of Mobile Suit Gundam fame, these figures would be 112 scale, have 30 points of articulation, and would be released as acts, with a total of 12 being produced. Their innovative concepts could surely have produced an anime series to go along with it, but unfortunately, it never materialized. In 1986, Tonka, an American toy company best known for making toy trucks and construction vehicles, would take an interest in Bandai's unique Spiral Zone line and license the rights to produce their own version of the figures and vehicles here in the US. Much like Hasbro's treatment of Takara's Transformers, Tonka would create a cartoon series in order to drive the merchandise sales. Developed by writer J. Michael Straczynski under the pseudonym Fetus Grey, a total of 65 episodes would be produced and air in syndication. Straczynski, however, would take his leave after writing only one script. This was allegedly due to changes made to his initial concept for the show. In the year 2007, half the world has been covered in spirals of a mysterious dark fog that is simply referred to as the Spiral Zone. This is the result of a very calculated plan by an evil scientist named Dr. James Bent. Using a sophisticated shuttlecraft that literally spirals around the world, he drops various pods all over the planet that become zone generators. These zone generators, once activated, begin to emit a bacterial-like fog. Once people are exposed to it, they lose their free will and become susceptible to command. Their eyes become yellow, their skin breaks out in red and orange legions, and they become zoned. The man responsible, Dr. James Bent, then takes on the name Overlord and with his team who he dubs the Black Widows, looks to further his expanse of total world domination. The UN, realizing that they need to counteract this threat of a common enemy, recruits a group of elite soldiers from around the world to form a team with specialized suits, weapons, and vehicles called the Zone Riders. From America, Commander Dirk Courage, the leader of the Zone Riders. Lieutenant Max Jones, second in command. From Japan, Lieutenant Hiro Taka. From Germany, Sergeant Tank Schmidt. And from Russia, Katerina Anastasia. The Zone Riders' mission to enter the zone and destroy generators, as well as gather any information that could help them understand the zone better in order to more efficiently combat Overlord, put a stop to his plans, and finally end this nightmare. The rider suits are made of a special material known as Neutron 90 that protects them from the effects of the zone. However, Neutron 90 seems to be extremely rare and in short supply. Initially, only five suits could be made. It isn't until halfway through the season that we see more suits produced, thanks to the genius of Ben Franklin, a new recruit to the zone riders. Ben figures out how to use the residual Neutron 90 of the previous five suits to make two new ones, one for himself and fellow newcomer to the team, the Australian Ned Tucker. In opposition to the Riders are the Black Widows, Overlord's top lieutenants, but unlike Zoners, they have free will thanks to a machine called the Widowmaker. Once processed through this machine, they become completely immune to the effects of the Zone, but it comes at a cost. They become permanently disfigured and marred by red and orange patches all over their bodies. They consist of the aforementioned Overlord. From the Middle East and second-in-command, Bandit, from England, Duchess Dyer, and the Americans, Reaper and Razorback. Like the Zone Riders, they also add two new recruits to their ranks in order to even the score. A French mercenary named Crook and Raw Meat, an American found in the backwoods of the Appalachia. The conflict between the Zone Riders and the Black Widows truly epitomizes a war of attrition in a post-apocalyptic setting. But for a show that's almost 30 years old, Spiral Zone holds up surprisingly well. It has an original story, a diverse array of characters with interesting backgrounds, 
and it tackles some real life issues such as claustrophobia, sexism, and zoophobia. You also see a fairly realistic look at how war can really affect people's lives. Personal romances are put on hold, fatigue of war sets in, as well as feelings of revenge, despair, and regret in what feels like a never-ending struggle. Only through iron will, cooperation, and hope do the heroes persevere. Even though it's a war, no one dies, but unlike other shows, Spiral Zone finds a plausible and pretty good way to explain this. The zone generators are fueled by human life force, so for the Black Widows, it's imperative to keep as many people alive as possible. Whereas the Zone Riders cannot morally bring themselves to kill enemy soldiers that they know are devoid of their will, and have no real way to distinguish whether they're innocent or not. The flaws are typical for shows of that era. Most of the episodes would have a story arc that would be resolved by or before the end of it, making it very repetitive. Some characters are developed a little bit more than others, and though the show was 65 episodes, the series ends with no real resolution since the second season never went into production. The last five episodes of the series are literally made from stock footage of previous episodes edited all together. I can only assume that this was done as an attempt to give the series some kind of closure, but the only thing you're left with at the end of episode 65 is that the fight between good and evil will go on. Spiral Zone would go on to see a home release in the form of three VHS tapes with two episodes each in 1988. No other official release has been made since. In 2006, however, the now-defunct Spiral-Zone.com released an unofficial DVD set after being provided with the master tapes by series supervising producer Pierre Dessel. As was and is still the case today, Spiral Zone's abrupt end can be tied back to its merchandising sales, specifically its toy line by Tonka. A total of nine figures and four vehicles were produced for this line and were available in stores in 1986. For the Zone Riders, we have Dirt Courage, Max Jones, Hiro Taka, and Tank Schmidt, their vehicles, the Zone Rider Cycle, and Commander Courage's Rimfire Cannon. For the Black Widows, Overlord, Bandit, Reaper, Duchess Dyer, Razorback, and their vehicles, the Sledgehammer Tank, and Overlord's Bullwhip Cannon. Several additional suits and accessories were also released. Had the series continued, the remaining Zone Riders, Katarina, Anastasia, Ben Franklin, and Ned Tucker, as well as the Black Widow's Crook and Raw Meat would have been released in 1988. For the time that these figures and vehicles were released, they had quite a bit going for them. They were fairly accurate to their show counterparts, the figures stood at 6 inches each, had cloth uniforms that could be changed, accessories specific to each figure, multiple points of articulation, and were quite durable. Each character also came with a bio and info sheet, but even more unique, came with a cassette tape that actually has each of their respective voice actors from the cartoon series in a story adventure. If there are any drawbacks, it would of course be the plastic pieces. They don't always stay on the uniform the way you'd like, and will break if mishandled. And because the uniforms are cloth, you can expect them to get frayed over time. The accessories and vehicles have spring-loaded weaponry, which, not surprising, will get worn to the point of being inoperable with constant usage. Overall, I have to say, the quality of these toys is really good. They just didn't sell well. This could be due to the assumption that boys might have thought of them as dolls as well as their retail price of $8.99 each as opposed to other more popular figures like G.I. Joe that only retailed for $2.99 each at the time. A four-part comic book series was also made by DC Comics. These issues served to flesh out the characters a bit more, particularly Overlord, and his defining descent into evil by killing his older brother as a child, which was done out of jealousy and resentment of his father's favoritism for his older sibling. In some ways, Spiral Zone was ahead of its time. It offered something dark and serious, as opposed to the more light-hearted and campy cartoons of those days. But ultimately, it was competing in a space that was dominated by the likes of Transformers, G.I. Joe, and Thundercats, so it went mostly unnoticed. In 1991, though, Hasbro would buy out Tonka, and to this day, they still retain the rights to this great series. So maybe, just maybe, someday, we could see an official release. I'm John, and these are the Retro Chronicles. Thanks for watching. We will fight on our honor, what is right, we'll defend.